we've talked about building a boat. And of course, the construction of the boat doesn't matter if it doesn't get out to sea. Inaugurating your nonprofit organization, docking it comfortably in your community, and launching it into your public's imagination is crucial. Watch how media and public relations have turned San Benito into a force for their community and a desirable partner and collaborator with other agencies for the public good. Like maybe this kind of shot? The valley's sun shines brightly for an Austin film crew shooting a documentary on the San Benito Literacy Center. You have to develop a long-term relationship with those organizations, those media people that can can help you. When you have one of the hometown people become an actual star, you want to honor him in your hometown, and that's what the San Benito Literacy Center wants to do for Freddie Fender. Tell me about this parade. What all do you have planned for the parade? That's the next day, and that's when right. the actual naming the of the street. The next day is the uh, ribbon cutting at a street that will be named Freddie Fender Lane, and the street has been... Every, everybody has a celebrity in their hometown. They have somebody who's important in their hometown. And we felt it was a good way to honor, not only honor Freddie for his good work, but um, a way to promote the Literacy Center and our project. You, you can't send out press releases and expect people just to flock over. You have to really, really work at it. When I was first opening the center uh, on the Bat Street area, I uh, called Martha McLean at the newspaper, or shall we say the managing editor at the newspaper, and um, she said, what can I do for you? And I said, I need an interview. <laughs> I don't know how to say this. And she said, OK. And so she came down, and we took pictures. There was a full page in the uh, newspaper for the Wednesday issue, which is the one where they were waiting for news for that particular issue. I think the, the organization works well with the media simply because it has an open door policy. Every time I want to come in here to do a story, if I have questions, they get answered. Um, someone's always here to answer those questions. We don't have a separate strategic media plan, I don't believe, but certainly we go talk to those folks on a regular basis, whether we have anything to say or not. That's just good public relations within itself, is going out and talking to them, making them aware of what we do. I think for a nonprofit organization to have a good relationship with the media, you have to have all these plans of attack in terms of getting their attention. You know, make sure that they know that you're interested in, in having coverage of, of your organization, of your event. Tell me a little bit, how do you feel about having this group here? Are you kind of excited or? We're very excited. Uh, we developed a relationship with Austin. Community I would College. say keep up your public relations by all means. Go beat the streets if you have to. You have to get people out there knowing what's going on. And so many people have a different picture of literacy in their minds. They have no idea what you're doing. And I think making that awareness to these people is a really constant effort. It's almost like a movie show. We have to get out there and show the public what it is. The press is a one-shot deal. Public relations is ongoing, where we have our board members, our students, our faculty Hello. Uh, in the community creating a positive Hello. image of what we're doing. How are you all doing today? You really have to get out there and knock on doors. I'm at the Literacy Center. Come on over and see what we do. I call several businessmen. I've got a coffee pot going over here. Do you want to come over for a minute? And they would come through and actually see the, uh, the area and see what we had done. Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Ornella. How are you? How are you? How are you? How are you? We're here from uh, the Literacy Center. And then they all want to be a part of it. See, that's the other thing, too. If you let that be their idea. I want to be a part of that. So that's, that's kind of how you build public relations. You talk about your business and you bring it to other people's attention. As you can see, making your news known is only the first part of creative media planning. Here is public relations expert Tony Gardner discussing the possibilities for the successful marketing of your organization. Tony? Thank you, Aaron. First of all, I would like to say public relations is a very, very powerful tool. With public relations and working with the media, you have an opportunity, such a wonderful opportunity, to create an opinion, you can reinforce an opinion, 
and more importantly, you have the opportunity to even change an existing opinion. So I think focusing on public relations from a strategic standpoint, thinking about creating, reinforcing, those type of things, I think it's really, really important that organizations look at public relations from a strategic standpoint. And when people are developing their public relations strategies, what kind of advice do you give them? When they say, I don't know, what do I do? How do I start? I think one of the first things I would tell them is think of it from a strategic standpoint. Public relations isn't off the cuff. It isn't off the cuff marketing. And so I think the first thing I would tell them, let's work on developing a plan. And how do we think about a plan? If I've got an organization, what's the first step I would take toward developing a good PR plan? I think before you even write the plan, you want to keep in mind that you're trying to develop and mold your organization where it's seen as being great. And let me give you an example. I think about um, Pike's uh, Fish Market in, in Seattle. Uh, just everyone going to work, kind of mundane, just working in a fish market. But what Pikes Peak uh, did in uh, Seattle, Washington, is that they wanted to create a world famous fish market. They wanted to move from good to great. So I think about internally, before you even write the plan, you have to go enter it into it with the belief that we're not trying to only be good, we're trying uh, to be great. And if you can get the organization and upper management and others within the organization to buy into that philosophy, it's first believing they have to buy into the philosophy that the goal is to become great. When you have that type of buy-in, then I say you're ready to develop steps to writing your plan. You know, a lot of times when you hear about the politicians on, uh, and when they're being trained to run, they talk a lot about staying on message. Correct. And you believe that's a really important thing to do for PR, right? That's really important. I think it's important to um, stay on message and to stay on topic. Not only does that help your organization, that helps the uh, media professionals uh, develop interest in your organization. And so now once I've, I've decided, what is, is the first thing I need to do is to decide what my message is? I think the first thing you need to do is take a step back and before you enter into developing your message is to first see and look at what type of relationships you have with the media. I think the first thing you have to do is build solid relationships before you begin pitching a story and before you begin executing your plan. Building, so that means I should go take cookies and candy to all the reporters in my neighborhood? I'll talk about that in a second, but yeah, it is as simple as, as doing that. I think when I, when I mention build relationships with the media, the most important thing is getting to know the electronic media, getting to know the print media, even if it means calling them up, introducing yourself, inviting yourself into their organization, let them take you on a tour. They're more than happy. I've done this many, many times. I've toured newsrooms to understand the intricate workings of a newsroom. I've toured uh, newspaper organizations to understand how they get their product out. And I think once you understand the product and service of an organization, it helps you better understand the role of that, um, that media organization. So I know for me, in terms of building relationships, it also helps you in the long run build equity. It helps you to develop professional relationships with the media so that maybe in a time of crisis that you will be able to garner more positive press. I'm not saying that if it's a negative story they're going to write it positively because they know you, but it does help when you build, uh, and, and when you build relationships um, with the media. Now, I mean, can I just saying that can I just, do I just call up and I say, oh, hi, uh, Ms. Reporter, I'm Aaron with uh, the Chicago Literacy Project. I'd just like to meet you? It's as simple as that. Really? I, I, as I mentioned, I've done it. And I think once you, I would encourage all organizations, because when you call up, you take a tour, you go over and you meet the assignment editors, you have an opportunity to meet some of the reporters and producers. Then when you call up, they have a frame of reference to pull from. And so when they run your story, you had kind of chuckled and joked about taking cookies. What I do once a year, I visit the electronic media and I visit um, the print media. And I take chocolate chip cookies <laughs> because they have covered our stories. And I say thank you for letting me call in my chips. So what they see then in their organization is, is cookies, but they also get to see your organization's logo. So therefore, they may not know who brought the cookies over or brought the chips over, but once again, 
with brand marketing. You're trying to make sure that they have some type of uh, frame of reference of your organization. So the frame of reference that I'm leaving is positive. Someone brought cookies, we're hungry. And so therefore, when I call up and I introduce myself, they'll say, oh, you know, they know who I, who I am. So actually, I assume that all of the normal rules of building and maintaining relationships will apply. That, you know, no finding out or remembering people's birthdays and the, the kind of normal holiday things and just all of the normal social skills that you would apply to any relationship? Yeah, I think most definitely. I think those type of things come out when you're working with a reporter. But I really try to stay more on a professional uh, level with reporters. But sure, if someone mentioned uh, their birthday and you happen to remember that and you know, you can shoot them a quick note, happy birthday, uh, that'd be fine too. But more importantly, what I'm talking about is just being able to go into their organization, understand the intricate workings uh, of the organization, get to know who your beat reporters are. Not only that, but getting an opportunity to know who the Simon editors are and who are some of the producers even behind the scenes because they too will help you uh, get your story ideas out. And understanding the, understanding the schedules in a newsroom is important, right? Oh, that is, that is definitely important. A lot of times we want to get our message out, send a news release out, but what happens when you build those relationships or you visit a newsroom, when I talk about under, understanding the intricate workings of a newsroom, uh, I'm just going to take the electronic media for example. Uh, they have meetings twice a day because of the fast pace of the news media. TV and radio. Uh, yes, more so what I'm speaking of is television right now. They meet at 9 a.m. and they meet at 2 a.m. But if you, didn't under, if you did not know that, you may send a news release out at 9 a.m. Well, they're in their meetings and they're putting their schedule to de uh, together for that particular day. So your news release is basically sitting on their fax machine and not being part of that, that morning discussion. So when you talk about time, you want to send the news release out. The, I usually try to send them out by 8 a.m. And then that way it becomes part of the, their day book. And then they're able to discuss it in their morning meetings. But more important, I never send out a news release without making a phone call. And I think that's some of the other. Before or after? I've sent out a news release before. So I, I make the phone call before I send out a news and release. And tell them to look for it? Look for it. Give them a little synopsis of what it's about. Uh, let them know why it's relevant. Let them know how it may impact locally or why it may impact uh, on a state or national level. And so that way it's not coming across cold. And once you send it out, you call back and make sure they received it. Now, how do you think about faxes versus emails, for example, as ways to get out your release? Well, I think it goes back to what the station wants or what that uh, particular journalist want. Uh, you give them the um, information in the, in the method that they want it. If they want it electronically via email, you send it via email. If they tell you they don't want anything faxed, they want it email, then you send it email. And that's one thing, it's moving out of your comfort zone and uh, sometimes if it's, well, I, I fax every news release. Well, if there's an organization asking for it electronically, then you're going to have to implement uh, the criteria that they have in place. By the way, you've mentioned a couple times about news releases. Could you just talk for a couple seconds about news releases and how one thinks about writing them in press releases? Uh, do you mean, is it important to have like a good headline for your press release or how do you think about writing them? Well, I think most of the time when people talk about news releases, they just know that you're supposed to write a news release in inverted style. But more importantly, I think I'm it's... I'm sorry, well, tell me what inverted style is. Since <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's putting the most information, it's putting the important information really in your first uh, paragraph or your first three lines uh, or your first four lines. That's what's inverted. The lead. It's the lead. But it's, yes, it's definitely important to have uh, catchy uh, headlines uh, to, to gain attention. But more important than that, as I mentioned, if you're able to call ahead of time and tell the reporter or tell the assignment editor what's it's, what it's about and how relevant it is and the importance of it and how it affects the community, then you're going to uh, get more coverage than, uh, uh, given it, uh, than sending the news release, release out code. Because what organizations, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a mom and pop organization, or, or whether it's your CEO of an organization, the media isn't really interested in your organization. They're interested in the people in that organization. They're interested in the products and services that you provide to the community. 
and they're interested in the impact that you have on the community. So that's why it's important that those type of components be a part of your news release. All right, I've sent out my press release at the proper time to my good friend, the reporter, and now I get an interview. They're coming out to my office, they're bringing the camera. Now they're coming in another couple of hours. What do I do? How do I prepare myself for the cameras and for the interview, and how do I make sure I don't mess up? Um, I think, as I say, do your homework first. But more important, when someone, uh, a news station calls you or a, a print journalist calls you and say they want to cover a story, that's when even the secondary level of homework begins. And I think that is the time when you develop, once again, you have your talking points. But what I do and what I would encourage other organizations, whether you're a nonprofit, is then to sit down and role play. Have someone in your organization take the role as the reporter and begin asking you questions. That way it's going to help you be brief, concise, and you're probably going to have a, a, a lot more uh, a, a polished interview if you do the role play. And also the significance of that is that you will uncover uh, risk and deficiencies uh, before the re reporter. You mean, you mean in your own argument? In, your, in argument. your own in your own argument. In your own presentation. Correct, and that really really helps for you to do the homework ahead of time, and then it gives you whether it's a couple hours, it gives you a, a little bit of time to wordsmith, maybe to come up with different language. Uh, that will come across a little bit more positive had you not had that role play or interaction. And what I think is important, even though you're in the media relations department or the marketing, uh, marketing department, you're really not alone. I pull people in when I'm having an interview, come over to my office, I have an interview that's, that's in, in the, in going to take place in a couple hours, this is the topic, I let them read it. They may be reading it cold, but therefore they're going to come up with things that the reporter probably is going to ask you. They can develop probably some solid questions by reading that news release and then asking you questions. So it's really good to get your organization involved too. Now you mentioned, uh, this, this reminds me of what you were saying earlier about staying on message. So I suppose one of the important things to do during that interview is to make sure you know how to get your message out regardless of what the reporter asks. Is that true? That, that's correct. When the reporter comes over, as I said, you want to be brief, you want to be concise, you want to stick to your main uh, message points, and even one of the keys is also be comfortable in silence. If when the reporter is interviewing, interviewing you and you answer their question, you stop. Say what you want to say and shut up. Right, and a lot of times what happens when we're doing the interview, we really are the ones that kind of shoot ourselves in the foot, we get a little uncomfortable and we'll start talking about something that uh, may take the reporter on a different on a different role. So if you're knowledgeable about your um, your topic, and that's the main thing to keep in mind, you know more about your organization's mission, goals, and what you're trying to portray uh, than the reporter does. So feel confident that you know um, the information. And one thing I think that's also important to do is also have a humanistic tie to that. Not only do you want to talk about your organization, but you want to give examples of how you are affecting the community. Whether you have helped increase literacy by 10% or whether you're collaborating with, with other organizations to show that community tie. And when you show yourself as being a community partner, that also will give you um, a, a little bit more strength in presenting um, your message. Uh, most reporters love collaboration. They enjoy seeing how your organization is tying into the uh, uh, community at large because that helps them develop a larger package or a larger story. Now, I have heard you say, never say no comment. Is that true? That's probably the uh, journalist, uh, journalism 101. Uh, I think uh, what I have done in situations that are uncomfortable or if, if you find yourself in, in, in situations that are uncomfortable, whether it's a nonprofit or you're running a small organization, if you don't know, it's best to say, let me get that information back to you. Because first of all, you want to know if they're working on, on, first you would know if they're working on what their deadline is. So if you know that you have an hour or two to get some information, if you don't know it and you have to go to another resource, then at that particular time say, let me get that information back to you. Another thing that I would recommend is if there is an expert in your organization that has the knowledge, that has that product knowledge, and put them in front of the camera. Sit down with them as a PR uh, professional, coach them, role play with them, 
but it's good to share the wealth within your organization because what happens it you build uh, there's more advocacy being built even internally within your organization so if it means putting a volunteer on camera if they're really good at a certain subject matter use that person if it means using a faculty or staff put them in front of the camera coach them work with them and let them begin to also uh, uh, communicate uh, their, that information to, to the public. It doesn't always have to be the designated spokesperson. Now, you know, you, it's funny you talk about uh, one of the things that can help prepare for your interview is what you often talk about is reading a lot of news generally. A part of the good work of any PR professional is to be really well seized of what's out there in the media. That's really important. You want to stay abreast of what's going on nationally. And I know when I speak around the state, that's one thing uh, I've noticed that uh, we really, really don't do as public relations and marketing professionals. This is Texas. What do, you, <laughs> what do I care what they're doing up in Seattle? Well, if you're running a literacy program or you have an organization that you're involved with or on a board of a nonprofit, you want to read and identify some of the things that are taking place in Washington. You want to read the national newspapers because what happens, Aaron, it helps you begin to develop story ideas. It helps you to develop story angles. And you may be reading something by which you're noticing that a certain organization similar to, your, to yours, you can begin to identify some ways by which you can generate positive press uh, or be able to get some ink, as they say, in a national publication. That way you're able to identify who the reporter is. So therefore, you know, we have to think outside the box. When we live locally and we work in our organizations day to day, and you say it's just Austin, or you're in Houston, we always think from that standpoint of it's just right. Austin or Houston. And I think as I gave the example earlier about Pike's uh, Place Market, uh, about uh, Pike's Fish Market in Seattle, they were in Seattle but they wanted to become world famous, which means they wanted to stretch and go beyond their borders. And that's one, one I think that's one thing we need to really start doing, is looking beyond what, how we're affecting the community locally, but also take opportunities to show how we're affecting the community from a statewide or even a national level. My philosophy is, like Pike's uh, Fish Market in Seattle, think big, think of being world famous, shoot for the, shoot for the moon. Why you know, not? You, you just reminded me of one really great thing to do in interviews, and you just you just did it, which is it's great to refer to the interviewer by his first name. <laughs> it makes <laughs> it does well, it makes him like you. It makes him like, oh, she knows my name. She must think I'm okay. <laughs> well, by referring to the interviewer by their first name, they aren't going to send you flowers. But what it does do, it really helps uh, as an icebreaker. It helps them uh, become a little bit comfortable, but more important, it helps you become a little bit more uh, comfortable and it also tells them uh, that you're listening. So now I've taken your advice and I have referred to my interviewer by the first name and I did my homework so I knew the kinds of things that she or she wanted to find out. Now the, the interview is finished. I was wonderful. I was brilliant. I had great stats. So now the interview is over. Holy Any advice for what to do when the interview is finished? And that's where it starts again. You know, and, and what I mean by that is once you complete the, uh, the interview you then develop your own questions, meaning that once the interview is, is finished, always keep in mind, as long as that cameraman is in the office, if he hasn't begun to put his equipment away and you have not seen the tripod, you, you still comport yourself as if you're being interviewed because what happens, no offense, a lot of reporters after the interview, they'll say, I have one last question for you. <laughs> and that camera is still rolling and your mic is still on. But because they said thank you for the interview, you thought the interview was over, but that's kind of what you call the journalist, I got you, because they're looking to catch you off balance. They're looking for that sound bite or that headline. So what you want to do is comport yourself, even though they say the interview is over, and then you begin asking a few questions. Uh, did I answer your questions well? Was there something that, um, that you didn't understand that, that I have uh, communicated, making sure that nothing is uh, uh, being taken out of context or being misconstrued? Now, we're kind of sure running out of time here, mm -hmm. but I wonder if it's also important to measure one's success in public relations, and, and how do you do that? Well, there was a, a song a while back, I forget the artist, but it was, What Have You Done For Me Lately? 
-hmm. And with organizations, uh, when you work really hard as a, a PR professional or whoever is in that position uh, handling your public relations, you want to uh, set up what you call a library, which means you want a notebook uh, with all your news releases, you want videotapes with all your uh, press coverage, you want to keep copies of all your, your print uh, newspaper clips. But once you have that, you also want to measure and come up with a cost that if the organization had to buy that mm -hmm. advertising, this is what the value would be. Like, give me, let me give you a quick example. For the television stations, uh, let's say for a 30 second spot, let's say that's billed at $150. And if you're able to get a two minute uh, 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 segment on a news station, that adds up. And more important is that you have to realize and educate your organization that there's really only 12 minutes worth of news. That's why I say it's very important to measure. You have 30 minutes, you have sports, you have weather, you have the commercials, commercials, and you got about 12 minutes. So if you're able to get two minutes of a 12 minute spot, and let's say you're the lead, and let's say if, that, if you were able to have to buy that, that may have cost the organization $5,000 for free coverage. Yep. Now, there are many of the uh, viewers of this particular presentation who are going to be very small, some of the small not-for-profit organizations. Does a small not-for-profit have any, apply any different strategies? Does it require different strategies if you're small and up and coming than if you're already big and established? No, what I would say, I would apply the same uh, practical uh, applications that I talked about. Whether you're small, you still have to think about uh, Pike's Fish Market in Seattle. You want to become world famous. Whether you're in a medium-sized market, you want to become world famous. And whether you're in a large market, once again, you're trying to move from localization to take yourself to another level to, level to statewide and then even to national. So I will say these uh, applications are, 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 you can work them across the board. But now you've said a number of times about the Pikes Fish Market and the desire to be great. But I'm, I'm sure that there are some organizations that are just trying to survive. Now, is there no room for the mere struggle to, to keep existing in terms of a PR strategy? Isn't there something that's appealing about a str the struggle of the small? Well, you ask me and I'll give you my opinion. Yeah. If you have the mindset that you are struggling and you're just trying to survive, you're going to constantly be in that mode 5, 10, 15 years down the road. You think about, uh, when I say the Pikes Market, I really, really love their their philosophy. Right now there's training manuals, there's books written on the, right now on the fish philosophy. And it's about thinking large. And if you're an organization just trying to, to pay the bills, if you're just trying to keep the lights on, once again, you have to seize the opportunity. Look at the power of public relations by pushing your message out, by having energy, by getting the information in the newspaper and in front of the right people that will ultimately affect your bottom line. That, would help, that will help you to go head on and if you need a larger facility to embark on a, a capital campaign. So you really can't look at public relations from a standpoint of, you know, it, it's not boring. You have to get excited about it because the public relations eventually will help you accomplish your goals and it definitely affects your bottom line. So I guess even if you're a small struggling organization, you might just be a world famous one that they haven't heard about yet. Right, that's why it's important to push your message out and I think more, impo more importantly we talk about strategic thinking. Yep. Even though you're small, there are ideas and there's uh, accomplishments that you're trying to reach. You have to use that PR and marketing machine to help affect your bottom line, whether it's to increase membership, that helps with donations, and it helps you move to the, it, public relations and marketing can truly take you to the next level, and that's what it's about. And when we're sitting at that next level of exalted world fame, we will say, thank you, Tony Gardner. And I'll say you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>